Thank you for joining us for the ASPN COVID-19 Task Force webinar. The webinar will begin in two minutes. Thank you for joining us for the ASPN COVID-19 Task Force webinar. The webinar will begin in one minute. Thank you for joining us for the ASPN COVID-19 Task Force webinar. We will now begin the webinar with moderators, Dr. Timothy Deer and Dr. Dawood Sayed. Moderators, take it away. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank everyone tonight for joining us. Another night uh, here at home as we uh, stay alone, but come together. And uh, I think it's gonna be a great night. This is our first CME accredited course. And uh, we're gonna talk about peripheral nerve stimulation tonight, which I think will be hopefully very enlightening. Um, Todd, what are your thoughts on our seminar tonight? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome, you know, all the attendees that have uh, logged in to join us again. Uh, it's kind of becoming the new norm, our kind of evening social hours together now. Um, and uh, ASPN has really decided, you know, that we're going to continue to focus, you know, on the important things such as COVID and how we're going to respond to that. But really, I think uh, this is a great time for us to increase our knowledge base on new innovations. And that's really the spirit of ASPN is to really kind of bring these new cutting edge technologies, these innovative therapies and present them to our members and our, uh, our colleagues in a responsible way that's data driven. So I really couldn't have picked um, a, a better panel to, to do this. Really these guys and gals today are really the dream team of peripheral nerve stimulation. Uh, another added bonus for all of us as now every meeting on the calendar has been canceled and we're all probably gonna struggle a bit this year to get our CME credits. We're uh, providing uh, free CME credit for this webinar today and we hope to continue that uh, with our educational series. So uh, here's the instructions, you know, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, you do have about a 24 hour window to claim your CME. Uh, the information is here. Uh, with that, we'll give it to our uh, next, our first speaker of the night, uh, Dr. Ahmed Gulati. Uh, who I owe a lot to. Uh, he was actually one of my uh, faculty attendings when I was a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering in Cornell. Uh, sorry, I, I, I misspoke. First, we're going to have Erica Peterson talk about our Aspen mentorship program. So this is really an innovative, unique program that really want to launch for um, our residents, fellows, and junior attendings. Uh, and Erica, I'll let you take the stage. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, really an honor to uh, participate in this webinar series because there's so much that we uh, would like to do to build a community. A part of that community is trying to figure out how we can develop uh, the uh, those that need more support as they're trying to develop their own practice and come up with some decisions. And to that end, um, ASPN's developed uh, this mentorship program. And so I want to highlight that with the next slide here. That we've come up with a mission. The idea here is that ASPN wants to offer a mentorship program that is different from what is available in other societies. The idea here is that this is a valuable distinctive offering to develop talent and leadership skill among members that's all focused on scientific understanding developments, developing how we support patient engagement, as well as clinical applications of pain medicine treatment in a several different ways. Uh, to that end, we are hoping that we'll be able to offer a couple of different tracks of mentorship to people. 
and if you see here on the next slide, one of those will be just in terms of these sort of uh, one-off opportunities. These could be mentees at any stage of their career and really vary in uh, the levels of engagement. So first of all, uh, we're talking about one-off pairings that might address a specific request over a short term. Somebody decides that um, they've been in practice for a few years and are interested in trying to build a research program into their practice and would benefit from me a mentorship discussion with someone who has been there and can offer some insights into how to build that successfully and identify uh, the components of a research program that will make it successful in terms of those goals. Other options for that may be adding new techniques. For example, peripheral nerve stimulation may be something that somebody in current practice hasn't been exposed to, or in some instances, fellows and residents who haven't been trained in that because it's not part of the portfolio of the, um, the program that they're training with. And if we can offer uh, either individual partnerships um, or then also through the emergent therapies and skills development track, which includes hands-on cadaver labs as well, as um, a webinar and video series of instruction from masters that will offer the exposure to some of the techniques that people may not have otherwise gotten uh, to see uh, with enough confidence that they can incorporate it into their own practice. Finally, we are developing a track that we call Poster to Podium. The idea here is sort of uh, from the idea of couch to 5K. How do I go from barely scratching the surface of um, contributing to the scientific advancement and uh, goals to being an impactful speaker, researcher, and leader. And to that end, we're developing a program for early career pain clinicians to be able, and researchers uh, to be able to start with research goals and take that to a place where they feel comfortable, not just with developing a the questions to look into, but also uh, to present those and advocate for uh, those policy changes on their own. This is something that we hope will appeal to people both going into private practice or currently in private practice, and also to those in an academic track. We're just looking to support program directors and um, professors who are training fellows who right now may feel very restricted in what their opportunities are. And we're also looking for something that will support people as they go through the promotion and tenure process on the academic side. But we also recognize that a large proportion of people are in the private practice side and that they have development needs as well. So the best way to get involved right now is to join us with, through clicking our website, ASPN.com, send us an email through the contact and let us know what you're interested in, what needs are, and the timeline is developing. Uh, so we have some skills labs as early as September in conjunction with our annual meeting, and you'll see more details about that later, as well as our initial uh, research presentation slated for December. So with that, I just can tell you how excited I am to be launching this with the rest of the ASPN leadership, and I look forward to all of the interest and feedback that we'll get. You know, Eric, I just want to make a comment. You know, I, I watched you from the time of you left your training. You went from poster to podium to leadership. So you're the perfect example of how this can be done. So having you and Harry Sokoman and uh, Himakalea and Natalie Strand and Stan Golovac and others lead this program is really exciting to me. So is this for both people who want to be mentored and people who want to mentee both? Absolutely. So we uh, we are put, have a wonderful group of members within ASPN, some of whom already are volunteering to be mentors, but we absolutely know that there are a large number of resources within our members and hopefully some of the future members of ASPN who will be participants in this. And one of the other goals is that graduates of the Poster to Podium program particularly um, and of the Emerging Technologies Track program will be tapped to be mentors to upcoming classes. My hope is that it actually becomes a little bit like a fraternity where we can all identify what class of training people were in as they come up and develop. That's amazing. Dal, thank you very much, Erica. Dal, we're back to you. That's great. Your team is doing an excellent job uh, on that. And I look forward to you know us being able to kind of uh, get a lot of these younger physicians uh, to where they want to be in their career goals. So thank you, Erica. Uh, so next, now I'll go back to my former uh, faculty attending when I was a fellow back in 2010. I love this picture, Ahmed. I think this is the same picture from your fellowship. Um, That's my pre haircut picture. <laughs> you, you, you haven't aged a day, but Ahmed, <laughs> if, uh, Dr. Ahmed Gulati, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the um, 
head of uh, pain management at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, he's uh, very instrumental in uh, fellowship education. He was uh, someone that's really, you know, essentially world renowned now in ultrasound guided interventions and techniques. He's going to discuss with us um, this concept of short term peripheral nerve stimulation and how he's utilized, it, utilized that in his own practice and some of the literature, data, and mechanism action. Uh, Dr. Gulati, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Davood and Tim and ASPN for giving me the opportunity to talk about something very near and dear to my heart. Um, it uh, changed our name from temporary peripheral nerve stimulation to uh, short-term peripheral nerve stimulation. And I'm going to spend the next few slides kind of talking an overview uh, of that concept and how that can be useful in your practice. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we briefly cover um, the technology that we have available for temporary or short-term peripheral nerve stimulation, uh, a really cursory concepts of mechanisms of action, and then just reviewing some of the applications we have for our acute and chronic pain patients. Next slide, please. The, and what we have here is currently we have a treatment that is six, up to 60 days approved by the FDA. Uh, what is this device? Shown on the bottom of the screen is the actual lead, a uh, very small lead that can be directly implanted on or near a nerve. Uh, that lead is connected directly to the battery shown here. So unlike some other systems where there may be some degradation of electrical energy when it goes through the skin, in this particular case, if I, if I put a program in three milliamps, my lead contact will, the contact will also see three milliamps. This lead is removable, which is one of the differences that this device has compared to some of the other peripheral nerve stimulator systems on the market. Um, and it's a monopolar cathode, meaning that it's going to be a positive current at that tip of the uh, lead. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to really briefly, some of the specifics about this technology. Uh, it's very thin. It's got a spring-like feature, so it doesn't piston through the skin. Remember, this lead is directly connected to an external battery source, which means the wire is coming out of the skin and it's kept clean uh, and for around 60 days. Uh, because of its small diameter uh, and some of the other technological features, uh, the beauty is we haven't seen very many infections. Uh, in my own personal practice, I've seen erythema once or twice. Um, and so it's one of the most remarkable things I've seen for a device so long in the body, but actually coming out of the skin. Next slide, please. Uh, things you should know uh, that come in importance is the frequencies can be either 12 hertz or 100 hertz, and they'll come in into importance in the next few slides. The pulse width can be chosen from a very low 10 microseconds to all the way to 200 microseconds, and we can have a current anywhere from 0 0.1 to 30 milliamps. Next slide, please. So next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about a mechanism of action. And really you have to look, uh, next slide please. Really you have to look back into how we were percutaneously doing peripheral nerve stimulation centuries ago. And really it comes down to Ayurvedic medicine and chakras and Eastern medicine and acupuncture. And what I really wanted to highlight is the fact that we've understood stimulating a peripheral nerve in some form or fashion can have an effect in some form of pain or other ailments of the body. So for example, the bladder line, which is the thin blue line in the middle of the posterior thigh uh, is following the sciatic nerve. And that translates into the kidney line uh, the kidney meridian, uh, which will be following the tibial, uh, posterior tibial nerve. And these stimulating points not only help with ailments of the foot, but happen to help ailments uh, of the bladder and the kidney and other lower pelvic organs, which is something that's akin to what we do today, which is tibial nerve stimulation for um, bladder-related uh, urgency and incontinence issues. Next slide, please. We take these concepts with acupuncture and now try to apply electricity to them to have the same effect. So around 150, 200 years ago, we had the idea of making devices that are called transcutaneous electrical nerve systems. And then in the 20th century, using modified modifications of these devices, first as the electrete, and then it becomes uh, implantable devices such as the spinal cord stimulator. Next slide, please. Regardless of the electrical system that you choose, there are some general principles you have to keep in mind. And the reasons why we have uh, in this particular device a 12 Hertz and a 100 Hertz uh, frequency choice. If you look at the low frequencies, two to 20 Hertz, we tend to be able to activate A alpha fibers, which are the motor fibers. And at slightly higher frequencies, which is commonly known as high frequency stimulation or TENS, at a 50 to 150 Hertz, we tend to see simulation of the sensory system. We take advantage of these 
uh, classically for the wall of Melzack theory, the gate control theory, uh, when you feel something or you move something, you tend to not focus on the pain. There's some uh, feedback mechanisms that the um, body has to make this happen. Uh, there's some variables that you can change that we can um, modify that sensory experience. Some of those things are the pulse width, uh, 10 to 500 hertz uh, microseconds, the shape of it, um, but one of the concepts of TENS is that when you activate a TENS unit for, say, four to six times a day, 30 minutes at a time, once you turn off the TENS unit, you see to see some effects that are prolonged. And that's going to play an important part of how this device works uh, for our chronic pain patients. Next slide, please. Now, one of the issues with TENS units is that you can't overcome the resistance of the skin, so it makes a large field. But the beauty of peripheral nerve stimulation is that we can overcome the resistance of the skin. That allows us to put wires closer to a nerve, and maybe with some variables that we can use, such as low pulse widths, 10, 12 microseconds, that can activate an A-beta fast-acting fiber, which is comfortable in nature. It's vibrating, it's tingling, and not activate your A-beta slow-acting fibers or A-delta fibers. Um, that's the holy grail of peripheral nerve stimulation, to convert an unpleasurable sensation to a pleasurable one. And what are some of the ways we can do that? Next slide, please. Um, one of the interesting things from computer modeling data is to suggest that there is a certain distance away from a nerve that when you turn on and turn off a field, you may be able to preferentially activate your A beta fibers versus your A delta fibers. Uh, shown in this picture is depths of five millimeters, 10 millimeters, and 15 millimeters with the dark blue dots signifying the activation of A beta fibers and the green dots signifying the activation of A delta fibers. What you see here is that within if you're a distance between 10 millimeters and 15 millimeters, which is one centimeter to one and a half centimeters away from a nerve, you might be preferentially able to activate those pleasurable sensations and not the painful ones. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, one of the best ways to do this is to use some of the work uh, that many of us have done. This particular one is uh, Dr. Huntoon, a wonderful mentor using ultrasound to get close to a nerve. Next slide, please. Because some of our devices require distances of one to one and a half centimeters away from a nerve to be optimal, ultrasound has shown a way for us to do this. Well, we can use bony landmarks to determine where a nerve is in this particular place, in uh, this particular case, the radial nerve. What you can see is that even though the needle is next to a nerve, we could theoretically be one centimeter away and I should place the stimulating device further away and optimize the settings to get the pleasurable sensation that you need. Next slide, please. So now that we know how this device might be very beneficial to your patients, uh, what are some of the targets we can use this device for? Next slide, please. One of the interesting works from uh, Dr. Brian Enfeld in University of California, San Diego, has done some great work at trying to use a simple device that can be removed for acute pain issues. Uh, a lot of work with total knee replacements, bionectomy, and this particular slide is for rotator cuff surgery. And I know there's a randomized control trials uh, that are occurring in this space um, currently. Uh, what we notice is that in these trials, we know that we can make the pain better after surgery with this device. But what's been really unique, and this is a case series of 14 patients, 11 of which which had a brachial plexus uh, stimulation after rotator cuff surgery, um, even though the stimulator could not overcome the acute pain right after the surgery. After the first day, all the way to the 14th day, it could provide significant pain relief such that the patients only required zero or one tablet of oxycodone a day. So right here, we have an instance of a peripheral nerve stimulator that can overcome an acute pain syndrome and reduce the use of opioids, which is very unique. Um, you can translate this to some of the things that we do at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. We applied this for uh, acute pain syndrome, such as post herpetic neuralgia. Uh, so this does not have to be necessarily for post-surgical pain, but you can think about acute pain being treated uh, in this particular manner. Um, next slide, please. When we focus on work uh, with this particular device, a lot of work by John Che, and this is by Wilson uh, and his colleagues at Cleveland, uh, Case Western, um, talking about various pain syndromes that can be improved with this device. Uh, what we've seen is temporary stimulation of the axillary nerve at the location of the medial deltoid. Um, 
for subacromial impingement syndrome and similar data for post-stroke uh, shoulder-related pain and dislocation, uh, and subluxation, sorry. Uh, we see that stimulation of up to four weeks gives prolonged pain relief up to 16 weeks. And this has been a really interesting finding for something that otherwise is difficult to treat or where surgery may be not a, the best option for a particular patient population. Next slide, please. Well, we furthermore, we see is some work by uh, uh, Rick Rauch and his colleagues, uh, Chris Gilmore, uh, Leonardo Caporell, aka DJ Caporell, uh, with phantom limb pain. Now, we see work here of placing a stimulating wire in a very unique way. Uh, this wire, uh, two patient populations, um, both have eight weeks of treatment. However, one population does not have the first four weeks with treatment, but instead has a no treatment, has the wire in place, and the other treatment arm, the treatment arm has total of eight weeks of treatment. What you see here after four weeks is you see uh, almost 60% of patients have 50% improvement in pain, uh, whereas the placebo at four weeks had under 20% of patients having 50% improvement of pain. When you go back to the eight weeks, you see some of those patients that didn't have improvement have improvement of their pain, but probably what's most important, uh, next slide please is that you look at the same data up to one year, what you see is that the, even though there's removal of the stimulating lead for the patients who responded, their pain relief re remained in very good uh, one to two VAS scores, or sorry, um, uh, brief pain inventory scores uh, for both residual limb pain and phantom limb pain. And this goes back to the data that we have from TENS units, whereas if you apply a TENS unit for 30 minutes, you might have a relief of another 30 minutes to an hour. Now it seems like if you can have stimulation for two months, you might have prolonged relief up to a year uh, for phantom limb pain. And which is interesting, this is translated to improvement in depression, uh, improvement in global impression of change. Uh, it seemed like the eight-week stimulation was better than the four weeks of stimulation, so there may be some value to having prolonged uh, stimulation. Uh, next slide, please. And this might translate to something very uh, common in our pain population. This is uh, Dr. Caporell's uh, case series of two patients applying to chronic low back pain. So now we're applying the same temporary type of stimulation uh, to end branches of the medial branch nerve, uh, particularly near the multifidus. And what we're seeing here is that we have two patients that responded to um, having treatments for a certain period of time, six hours a day at 12 hertz. So you will see motor contractions of the multifidus muscle and they'll have prolonged pain relief. And you look at the next slide, please. And you see, you look following a short term of case series of nine patients, six of these patients had 80% improvement of pain that's prolonged. So you have one month of stimulation at six hours a day, and you see relief up to 13 or 14 months, which is very uh, unique. Here we have a population that may be normally treated with uh, radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation of a multi of a medial branch nerve, but instead now stimulation may be an option, especially for some of our younger patients who do not want denervation of their uh, erector spinae muscle as a potential treatment option um, should concerted treatments not work. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, it's, it's very interesting to see a field that's beginning to see some similar outcomes to spinal cord stimulation, which has become the standard of neuromodulation data. Uh, I think we're gonna see some novel ideas coming in this particular field. We know in oncology, we use these devices. Uh, this is work by Maincar and his colleagues and I guess Sloan, uh, Sloan Kettering. Um, it's stimulating the brachial plexus in a patient with an invading pancos tumor. And this particular patient couldn't tolerate opioids and didn't have pain relief um, with the stimulator did have the pain relief at the end of life, which is some unique ways and strategies uh, applying this particular system. Again, thank you very much. And I'll give it back to uh, Tim and Dawood. Uh, just one great job, Emmett, as always. One, one quick question for you, and we'll come back to the very end for a lot of questions, but is there any uh, need to use a ultrasound guided nerve block before we go to peripheral nerve stimulation? Would, you know, for example, I saw someone today, I did a super scapular nerve block for shoulder pain. Should I do that a few times before I go to a uh, temporary peripheral nerve stimulation system? Uh, very good question. Now, I think the nerve block gives you confidence that you can target a nerve with ultrasound, that you can find the nerve with ultrasound. But in terms of stimulation, specifically, does a lidocaine injection and numbing a nerve translate to pain relief? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, we've seen cases where you have disease in the spinal cord, uh, C5 tumor resection, and we've stimulated a suprascapular nerve uh, for shoulder pain. 
and that gave the pain relief of the entire pain syndrome. So my point is, is that the confidence of targeting a nerve may give you an appropriate target for stimulation, um, but that the block itself does not necessarily translate to the pain relief that you may get with stimulation. They just work on different mechanisms, and it's been very interesting to target something distal uh, to help something proximal with the pain serum, which we never would have done with a local block or a neurolysis, but we really can do with stimulation as long as the dorsal root ganglia is intact and the signal can make it back uh, to the spinal cord and the brain itself. No, great answer. And uh, we'll hear from you a little bit later in our final question and answer panel. Thank you so much, Dawood. You're Fantastic. welcome. Fantastic job, Amit. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ramu Naidu. He's really emerged as one of the leading kind of thought leaders on peripheral nerve stimulation. He's been tasked with talking to us about, you know, what are the techniques and what are some of the good indications for PNS? And he's also going to give us a bit of a teaser on some of these new platforms coming out that are really specific for PNS and what are some of the advantages of utilizing those compared to what we had to do historically. Ramo, the stage is yours. Thanks, Dawood. Next slide. So good evening, everyone. I hope you're all safe and sane through this crazy time. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 12 to 15 minutes talking about patient selection and peripheral nerve stimulation, then talk about targets and orientation, and then go into three specific indications and techniques. And this is a very brief overview, so I'm hoping you'll join us at our Aspen and PSPS cadaver labs over the course of the next year when we can all get together. So starting out, uh, patient selection criteria for peripheral nerve stimulation. So here are five criteria that if you're just getting into peripheral nerve stimulation might be really helpful. So the first is to really understand the diagnosis understand where the mechanism of injury occurred, where it occurred along the nerve, and, and ensuring it's the peripheral nerve, because as Amit pointed out, if the DRG is intact and the injury is distal to that, you can probably do something. If it's proximal to that, you might want to consider other therapies. Uh, the second is to identify the injured nerve. And again, Tim, you guys were talking about this, but some of the things that we can do as pain physicians is do those diagnostic blocks. So as Amit responded, you can use those lidocaine or bupivacaine-based blocks to really aid in your diagnostics, uh, in addition to your usual use of MR uh, and EMG nerve conduction studies. But oftentimes, these nerves are so small, it's difficult to identify which particular nerve. So that's where the diagnostic blocks come in uh, very handy. Uh, the third and fourth points are really uh, things we're used to in the world of neuromodulation, neurostimulation, and spinal cord stimulation, in that when we're going to implant somebody, we want to ensure there's an absence of psychological issues uh, such as substance abuse or somatoform disorders. Uh, the fourth point is probably the most important point with any implant. It's really understanding your patient's motivation, intelligence, their expectations, and their understanding of the management of the device. Now, all the platforms you're hearing about today, they all have their own bells and whistles. So just because we are talking about peripheral nerve stimulator systems, there might be a specific system that works better with a particular patient versus another. And some of the things you need to think about are the external uh, devices, uh, the graphical user interface, and the charging burden. Uh, so all those things should play a role in, in your decision making. And then the last point is specific to certain platforms, certainly not all of them, uh, but a successful trial of neurostimulation of the identified nerve should go on to lead to implant. Next slide. So with peripheral nerve stimulation versus dorsal column or spinal cord stimulation, there are some advantages to both. And with the dedicated peripheral nerve stimulator systems, these are small, versatile implants. Uh, you avoid the need to cross leads over joint lines, which as those of us who have done spinal cord stimulation for peripheral nerves, uh, sometimes we have to do that and it's, it's a bear. Uh, generally, patients accept the peripheral nerve stimulator systems more just because uh, there's not a procedure being done around their spine when it's their finger that hurts or their foot that hurts. Uh, now, contrast that to our spinal cord stimulator systems. All, all the ones that have been around for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, they offer a wide uh, range of therapeutic options. All the waveforms you can think of, HF10, Burst DR, uh, with DTM, we've got all this great new stuff coming out uh, that we don't see in the PNS world so much. Uh, and then we have the full feature set of all the things we can do with it. Uh, we can trial, so we give the patients a week or 10 days to see how it feels. And then, of course, there's established reimbursement. So this particular platform I'm going to get into actually has sort of the best of both worlds and is also an SCS system. Next slide. So here's the hardware with this particular platform. Uh, some of this is very familiar to you who do spinal cord stimulation. You have your usual octrode uh, lead with no tines, which is the second one from the left. But there is a quattrode uh, lead with tines. So this obviates the need for any anchoring 
and allows the contacts to remain in place relatively co close to that nerve. As you can see here, the implantable pulse generators are about the size of a dime, uh, and they come in either a single quadrode, single octrode, or dual octrode uh, ported device. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the smartphone app uh, with this particular platform and the external therapy disk. And for this particular platform, the therapy disk is really the energy source that uses near-field communication to then uh, provide the energy for the implantable pulse generator that's implanted under the skin. Next slide. We're gonna focus on five generic areas uh, for you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna first talk about the shoulder and really specifically talk about the suprascapular nerve, then go on to the ilioinguinal nerve or the abdominal region. Uh, but this can also include intercostal nerve targets. I know Dr. Syed has done a number of intercostal uh, procedures. Uh, the back is, of course, a hot topic these days, and both Amit and Chris are talking about it to you tonight with the medial branches. Uh, the knees, the saponous nerve, I'll talk about that. But, of course, there are other targets, including genicular nerve branches or the femoral nerve. And then the lower extremities, the tibial and peroneal nerves. Next slide. So the preferred method of placement is with the lead is parallel to the nerve. And the reason for that is this allows more electrodes to contact the nerve. So if there's any motion or migration, you can still recapture stimulation of that nerve. Uh, there may be situations where you do need to be orthogonal to that nerve, but just understand there's a limitation if that patient moves or is moving and that electrode or contact configuration is jostling. Next slide. So I'm gonna start out with the ilioinguinal nerve um, and we're gonna give you a, a particular pattern or technique that we think is consistent, but certainly you may learn from others from different societies or different uh, sponsors on how to do and attack this nerve. So uh, we're gonna start with the ASIS approach uh, heading medially towards the inguinal canal. Uh, the pathologies that are included are good targets or individuals who are status post hernia orophy who have chronic pain after that procedure. It's estimated there are 100,000 Americans every year who develop chronic pain after this particular surgery, uh, but it can be done for post-ventral hernia repairs or post-hysterectomies. Uh, the implantable pulse generator for this particular target is placed in the anterior abdomen, which is a comfortable place for our therapy disc that adheres to the skin surface. Uh, you can use either lead, uh, and we'll show you uh, with the next slide, uh, the actual images of the ilioinguinal nerve. Next slide. So the ilioinguinal nerve, as we all know, comes from the T11, T12, and L1 intercostal or nerve roots, uh, then comes together and then comes around, wraps around to the anterior inguinal uh, canal groin region. And so our next slide, our target here is again, to be parallel to the nerve, our approach is to start laterally, basically along the mid axillary line, start at the ASIS and drive our 14 gauge 2E medially and inferiorly towards the inguinal canal. And then what we can do is actually place our implantable pulse generator along the anterior abdomen, which is a comfortable position for that therapy disc. Next slide. Here's an image of Dr. David Spinner at our Austin lab. Uh, you can see in this particular cadaver, they're quite emaciated. So in the ultrasound image, you can see the peritoneum, that white line uh, that's, that's separating sort of the grayish to the dark hues. Uh, below that is basically where the bowel is. Above that are what would be the three layers of the abdominal wall, which you can't really see very well because of this cadaver. Uh, but the ilioinguinal nerve is, is situated between the transversus abdominis and the uh, internal oblique. And you can see the nice bone shadow from the ASIS here. Uh, if you look at the picture, you can see that purple circle. It's so important to mark up and really draw out and diagram everywhere you want the IPG, the therapy disc, and the leads to be. This is one of the things we recommend for all peripheral nerve implants to really do that before you actually put any needle in them or any incision. Next slide. Now we're gonna talk about the suprascapular nerve. This is a, a, a really hot topic and hot target just because the suprascapular nerve innervates, it's estimated anywhere from 60 to 75% of the shoulder region. And really when we look at other neuromodulation therapies, they really can't attack the shoulder as well. So this is a great niche for peripheral nerve stimulation overall. Uh, there are two approaches I'll, I'll discuss tonight. One is the medial to lateral approach. And then the second is the posterior approach. I'll show you in the diagrams what I mean by both of those approaches. The pathologies are, are quite large. It can include post-arthroplasty pain syndromes, post-rotator cuff, or even in individuals who couldn't have surgery who go on to develop adhesive capsulitis. So in my practice, I have a lot of 80 to 90, even 100 year olds who never can have a surgery, but they have severe shoulder pain limiting their function. The implantable pulse generator replacement can be on the lateral aspect of the shoulder over the deltoid or potentially down low in, in the uh, lumbar region in the flank. 
Uh, you can use either lead configuration. You can see the nerve distribution here and the motor uh, distribution as well. This is a nerve where you can use fluoroscopy. Uh, however, I would say that all of us on this call tonight are saying really try to use ultrasound because the advantages to ultrasound are that you can really see where the nerve is. You can see where your needle and lead are placed adjacent to that nerve. And then of course, avoid vascular structures. These are, these are things you cannot do with fluoroscopy, uh, but it's okay to use both. There's no question about that. Next slide, please. So here's the schematic of the suprascapular nerves bilaterally in purple. And you can see it comes along the suprascapular fossa, ducks down through the suprascapular notch, and then radiates outwards towards the shoulder. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the two approaches we've been discussing. On the left-hand side is this medial to lateral approach coming down and into the suprascapular fossa. So we can take our ultrasound probe and basically look into the fossa, identifying the suprascapular artery and nerve. Uh, once that lead is placed, you can tunnel it immediately all the way down to the flank. Uh, the caveat here being that the scapula can actually move and, and kind of irritate that lead. So it is a consideration, but nonetheless can be done. You can also place that IPG over the clavicle and the anterior chest wall or even to the deltoid. Uh, on the right-hand side is really the approach we strongly recommend moreover because this allows the, the lead to be more parallel to the nerve and really catches the nerve as it exits out and heads towards the shoulder. So you really get a good sensory distribution here. Um, the lead can then be tunneled again to the, the lower flank. And the next slide, uh, we'll show you some of the ultrasound imaging that, from Dr. Spitter. And here you can see the suprascapular notch with the suprascapular nerve within it. Uh, again, it's not, it's not really fair to you in the audience to really see a single image or a static image of ultrasound and say, oh yeah, there's the nerve and there's the needle and it's easy as that. Uh, ultrasound really requires relational anatomy. So really looking at things dynamically. And that's why we strongly encourage you to join our cadaver labs uh, over the course of the year. Next slide, please. The last target I'll get into is the saponous nerve. And I think most of us are very familiar with this target. Uh, it, the pathologies include neuropathic knee pain, whether after a surgery, whether arthroplasty or arthroscopy, or even in someone who developed an AVN from steroid therapies or cancer. Uh, lots of different indications here. This is a very hot topic. Large volume of patients in the United States every year with chronic neuropathic knee pain. Again, the lead configuration might be better to use the, the four or quattrode uh, time lead because of the mobility as that patient's trying to move and walk. It could, could uh, lead to more migration. Uh, the IPG location we re we're going to recommend is in the anterior or lateral thigh so that therapy disc can sit uh, comfortably. And we really do strongly recommend ultrasound for this particular approach because there is vasculature nearby uh, that could be pierced with that 14 gauge Chewy. Next slide. So here's a schematic with the saponous nerve. And I think many of you who are anesthesiologists are very familiar with this anatomy from the adductor canal blocks. That saphenous nerve branches off the femoral nerve and is really primarily a sensory nerve, especially distally away from the femoral nerve. That's one of the advantages about uh, taking on this nerve in that we avoid any motor stimulation. Uh, and branches of the saphenous nerve include the infrapatellar branch, which really drive into the medial and inferior aspect of the knee. And oftentimes arthroscopic ports pierce right through that nerve. So this is a common source of pain for a lot of patients who have that particular surgery. Next slide. So again, what we recommend is driving that needle parallel to the nerve, uh, coming in from a medial approach down towards the knee, uh, and then tunneling that IPG to the anterior, or even the lateral thigh. Wherever the patient is most comfortable with that therapy disc, that is probably the best location. Next slide. Here again is Dr. Spinner uh, using his ultrasound to visualize the saphenous nerve, which in this particular picture is this honeycomb appearance here. You can see the vastus medialis and sartorius muscles not in the greatest detail uh, as you'd see in a live patient or in other patients, but at least it gives you a good sense of, of the anatomy that we're looking for. So that wraps things up. I just gave three targets there in the, in the brief time I had, but we look forward to seeing you at our Aspen and PSPS labs over the course of the year, like I said, so we can do this all together. Thank you. So Rama, one quick, one quick question. You showed uh, some systems, and I know there's different systems that you and Amit discussed. Uh, one of the questions from our audience is, why not go right to a permanent PNS device? Why would you do a trial or a 60-day trial or a 10-day trial? What's the need for trialing with PNS devices? It's a great question, Tim, and I, I really think it comes down to the decision-making process. Do you have enough diagnostic criteria, firstly, to know that that is the right target? And then secondly, do you then have enough prognostic data to ensure that that implant is correct? So you don't necessarily have to do, depending on what system you use, a trial with a lead. You might consider doing sensory stimulation 
uh, with an RF needle or an SMK needle just to see if neurostimulation is the appropriate thing for that particular nerve. That still doesn't replicate what the peripheral nerve stimulator system is going to do, but it gives you a better idea. Um, of course, what plays a role in all of this is reimbursement, what the payer says you can do as far as trialing as well. So all of those factors play a role, but I'm not here to say you have to trial everybody, but certainly take, a, take into account all of those factors as you move forward. No, that's, that's a great answer. I like your insights. Thank you so much. Great talk. Uh, our last Thank talk you. of the night, Darwin, I'll give it to you to introduce. Great job, Ramo. Uh, our last and final speaker of the evening is uh, Dr. Christopher Gilligan. He's the Chief of Pain Medicine at uh, Brigham's and Women's. I think he gets the bit largest kudos of all the speakers tonight. Uh, he disclosed to us yesterday that he's actually covering COVID patients in the ICU. So really thank you for your service uh, on that, kind of go, stepping outside of your, your normal routine to help our patients. But uh, he's going to be discussing uh, this concept of, instead of just treating pain, actually this concept of restorative neurostimulation. He's the primary investigator on the uh, a big study, the Reactivate study, which looked at uh, medial branch nerve stimulation. Uh, our center was... Uh, honored enough to be a site on this, and I'll uh, give the uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Gilligan. Thank you. Great. Dawood, thank you. Tim, thank you. Uh, kudos to you uh, guys and to Aspen for putting this together, putting it together so quickly, and uh, thank you so much for the chance to present. Um, so we're targeting here chronic low back pain, and the first question, of course, is why are we targeting this? Well, if we look at the natural history of chronic low back pain, the study that I'm showing you here is a study where they followed 155 patients with low back pain for seven years. And I direct you to the lowest line in that blue table, severe chronic patients, 31 of them. And what they found was that patients who started out with severe chronic low back pain, after seven years, 74% of them still had persistent severe pain. And equally important, none of them had resolution of their pain. So quite simply, this is a condition that just doesn't get better. It doesn't have a favorable natural history. Next slide, please. The next question in chronic low back pain is, what percentage of these patients have neuropathic pain? Something that we're gonna think is typically amenable to traditional dorsal column stimulation. And what percentage have predominantly nociceptive pain? And when we look at patients who have not had surgery, and have axial chronic low back pain, we find that about 12% have predominantly neuropathic pain and about 70% have predominantly nociceptive pain. Next slide, please. So if we look at conventional dorsal columns, spinal cord stimulation, typically targeting neuropathic pain, often with a significant radicular component, often following prior back surgery, the leads are obviously in the epidural space within the spinal canal. And we're doing stimulation of the sensory fibers. This is a palliative stimulation that we're doing all of the time. On the other hand, if we look at musculoskeletal and nociceptive pain, that's often due to impaired muscle control. For many of these patients, they haven't had surgery, and in fact, surgery is not indicated. And the stimulation that we're doing is restorative stimulation. We're stimulating the medial branch nerve, to get the multifidus muscle firing again. And the leads, as you can see on the AP fluoro image, are outside of the spinal canal. Next, next slide, please. If we look at the average low back pain VAS over the course of 12 months, on the left, we have stimulation of the multifidus muscle. And what we see is a progressive increasing pain relief over time. The effect accrues over time, but it takes time. This is stimulation where patients are doing it twice a day for 30 minutes and the rest of the time the stimulator is off. The orange and blue is data from the Senza trial. The orange is traditional SES. The blue is high frequency, 10 kilohertz. And what you can see is, of course, the traditional stimulation gives us an immediate, quite profound pain relief and then some erosion of that over time. Again, that's with an epidural electrode placement, of course, and patients who are doing continuous stimulation. Next slide, please. Pain from non-neural structures can lead to impaired muscle control and atrophy. That's well demonstrated in both human models and in animal models. The MRI images on this slide are showing you fatty infiltration and atrophy of the multifidus muscle. 
With impaired muscle control, we get a vicious cycle of functional instability of the pain, of, excuse me, functional instability of the spine, and consequently, chronic pain. Next slide, please. The technology that we're looking at here stimulates the medial branch of the dorsal ramus, and in that way, it elicits episodic multifidus contractions, and the goal is to override multifidus muscle inhibition, reactivate muscle control, restore functional spine stability, and as a consequence, reduce pain. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like in AP and lateral fluoroscopic views. What you're seeing is leads at the bilateral L3 transverse processes, right where the transverse process meets the base of the superior articular process. And of course, that's to put the lead in proximity to the medial branch. These leads have tines on them that we deploy on either side of the intertransversari during the course of placement in order to hold them in place as that muscle contracts. Next slide, please. This is the design of the Reactivate B trial that we completed. 204 patients were implanted. We then randomized them in a one-to-one -one fashion. Half of the patients got therapeutic stimulation. Half of them got sham stimulation. We then followed them out to 120 days. And in 120 days, we did a responder rate analysis, comparing sham stimulation to therapeutic stimulation. In this trial, the definition of a responder was a patient who had a 30% or greater improvement in their low back pain vas, as well as no increase in analgesics for any reason. After that primary endpoint assessment, we then crossed over all of the sham stimulation patients to therapeutic stimulation, and we followed all of the patients up to one year and indeed beyond. You can't cross over the therapeutic stimulation patients to sham stimulation, because once you've gotten the multifidus firing, you can't, you can't unring that bell. This slide shows you who was in the trial. We had 204 patients at 26 centers in Australia, Europe, and the US. These were middle-aged patients. They were 47 years old. And on average, they had had 14 years of low back pain. 100% of the patients had failed physical therapy with an average of 31 sessions. 100% had failed pain medications. 37% of the patients were on opioids as they went into the trial. And 52% had failed interventional pain therapies. Key exclusion criteria were prior low back surgery or any indication for surgery, leg pain greater than back pain, or comorbid chronic pain conditions. The graphic on the right shows where these patients started. They had an average Oswestry disability index of 39. That's right where moderate disability meets severe disability. And they had average low back pain bass of 7.3 centimeters. Obviously, that's severe pain. Next slide, please. This slide shows all of the outcomes at the 120-day uh, point in the trial. Green here is therapeutic stimulation, red is sham stimulation. And if we start at the upper left, the primary efficacy endpoint, the responder rates, did not achieve statistical significance. Just below that, the primary analysis, the mean VAS improvement, did achieve statistical significance, favoring therapeutic stimulation over sham stimulation. The graphic cumulative proportion of responders, that's an analysis that FDA specifically requests, and that favored therapeutic stimulation over sham stimulation. In the upper right are the five secondary efficacy endpoints from the trial, and four of them were statistically significant, favoring therapeutic stimulation over sham stimulation. Those were Oswestry Disability Index, EQ5D, which is healthcare-related quality of life, mean percent pain relief, and subject global impression of change. The only one that didn't achieve statistical significance was resolution of back pain, and for patients with 14 years of back pain, we frankly wouldn't expect them to have resolution of back pain after 120 days of therapy. Both of the supporting analyses did achieve statistical significance. Those were treatment satisfaction questionnaire and the clinician global impression of change. Next slide, please. Here, what we're looking at is the cumulative proportion of patients who had different levels of pain relief over the course of the 365 days. 
the dark green at the top is the proportion of patients who had resolution defined as a vas of 2.5 centimeters or less. And by the end of the year, that was 48% of the patients. The next level down is 50% or greater improvement. And so that plus resolution is 62% of the patients. And you can see the rest, only 5% of the patients had no improvement at the one at the one year mark. Next slide, please. If we look at the improvements in pain over time, here the solid green line is the patients who got therapeutic stimulation. The red line is the patients who got sham stimulation. And then that turns into a dashed green line when they get crossed over to therapeutic stimulation. What you see is a pretty profound placebo response in the sham stimulation, followed by a catch-up period, and then a continuous improvement that continues uh, out to one year and, and, and perhaps beyond. Next slide, please. This is the uh, results in terms of improvements in disability. Again, therapeutic stimulation in green, sham in red, and then dash green after crossover. And again, we see improvement that continues to accrue over time and a catch-up of the crossover group to the therapeutic stimulation group. Next slide, please. This graphic shows every patient in the trial. Every single patient is a yellow dot. And I draw your attention to the dark green in the lower left quadrant. This is based off of work by Roger Chu and Rick Dale. And what they did is they defined for therapies for back pain, what is a minimal, a moderate, or a substantial improvement in VAS and in Oswest Street Disability Index. And the dark green is the patients who had a substantial improvement in both their disability and their VAS. Next slide, please. In terms of safety, we saw a 3% infection rate. You can see a 14% implant site pain, but that's actually misleading. That includes patients who at the two week follow-up right after their surgery in the trial reported pain at their implant site, not surprising. The great majority of them actually resolved. Interestingly, we saw 0% lead migration. We think that's a evidence that the times worked very well. 7% of the patients had system explants. That includes patients who had an infection and patients who, who didn't, have, uh, didn't have therapeutic effect. Next slide, please. So summary and conclusion, chronic low back pain represents a large unmet clinical need. The natural history is unfavorable. The effectiveness and durability of available treatments, including SCS for nociceptive musculoskeletal chronic low back pain is limited. Restorative neuromuscular stimulation complements existing neurostimulation solutions. It targets impaired neuromuscular control. The rehabilitative treatment effect accrues over time, and there's compelling long-term effectiveness in treatment and crossover groups. In addition, we saw a favorable safety profile compared to other neurostimulation studies. Thank you very much. Chris, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that talk. We're gonna spend the last 10 minutes on what we call rapid fire. You're the first person in the hot seat. I'm gonna ask you a question. Thought I would have comment on your answer. Uh, my first question will be to uh, Chris, both Chris Gilligan and to Amit. Um, and it's, uh, these are from our audience. So question number one is, you know, do we do a permanent device like Reactivate, uh, or do we do a 60-day, um, you know, a medial branch stimulation that you talked about, Amit, like SPR? What what do we do? How do we know? Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, one minute, and then Amit the rebuttal. Sure. So I, th I think there will be some patients where permanent is going to be the right answer and some where temporary is. What I would point out is, first off, the system that I showed you is much better studied. 204 patients in a prospective randomized sham controlled trial multi multicenter. The other thing I would say is throughout one year, we saw continuous improvement over time. And we also saw incredibly high compliance by the patients, even at one year, still using their device pretty much every single day. So that indicates to us that patients are still continuing to get better and better out through a year and perhaps beyond and wanting to use the system. So we think for many of these patients, a permanent system is gonna, gonna give them the most, the, the most chance to continue to improve and improve. But some patients I think likely would, would uh, be appropriate for a temporary system. Yeah, great answer, great answer. Amit, your, your thoughts? 
Sure. Uh, no, I agree that the data for the temporary simulation is still coming out, especially the randomized control fashion. Uh, what you have to think about really, and I think Chris uh, uh, alluded to this, is what are patients going to prefer? Uh, and you had, you know, young patient, if I have chronic back pain, would I want a permanent device or would I like to try a, uh, a two-month system that may give me relief uh, for one or two years, I may actually, may not see my back pain come back. Uh, and so there's some other criteria, you know, like, you know, patients have their nerve, their medial branches already radio frequency ablated, um, are there, is there a multifidus already scarred? So there's a lot of different factors, but by and large, uh, to choose a 60-day treatment, it really comes down to patient preference at this point. Uh, clearly, the evidence leans towards a permanent system. Um, but in my population, I have a difficulty telling patients who may not have a long time to live to have a permanent device. In my oncology population, they would like to try a 60-day treatment because they're not thinking longevity of 20 or 30 years. They're thinking, what can help me with me, my family uh, for the summer? Talwood, yeah, your thoughts on that, on that question? Those are great answers. I have one follow-up uh, for uh, Dr. Gilligan. So, you know, this, this therapy seems to take a while to really take effect. How do we select patients for this therapy? You know, we're used to trialing patients for five to 10 days and then implanting them. Doesn't seem that that would make a lot of sense uh, with this restorative type of therapy. So can you describe to uh, the audience how that was done in the study, how you selected patients for this therapy? Sure, and uh, no, you're exactly right. We, did, we didn't do a trial. It was straight, straight to implant and then, as you were alluding to. We looked for patients who had some indicate chronic low back pain that was severe, refractory to physical therapy and medications, and we had them all reviewed by a spine surgeon. They couldn't have either a history of spine surgery or any indication for spine surgery. The patients who did the best, we think, were the folks who were a little bit younger, a little bit more active, um, and we went, we did go straight to, we, we did for everyone a prone instability test, to, you know, as you know, as an investigator on the trial, looking for some evidence of multifidus dysfunction. So we wanted to see patients who didn't have an indication for surgery, had failed PT and medications, were somewhat you know, motivated, young, you know, at least with an inclination to being active, and on physical exam, prone instability test, had some signs of multifidus muscle dysfunction. Now that's, a good, that's a great answer. And I was involved in both these studies, and I, I tell you that the selection was amazingly good. You guys uh, both uh, did a great job in those studies. I have a question for Ramo and Erica. Ramo, um, the question is, you know, how difficult is it to learn how to do a suprascopular nerve block? Again, I said the other night, Tina Doshi came and taught me ultrasound. I didn't even know how to do ultrasound. I learned the last couple of years. How difficult is it? And then for Erica, how do we train people who've never done it, who are already out of their fellowship? So I'll start with Ramo and then to Erica. Sure. So I think it all depends on your familiarity with using ultrasound uh, and then your familiarity with just watching your needle under ultrasound guidance. Uh, the procedure itself, if you have familiarity with those things, is very straightforward. I would consider it a very basic tier one type of procedure. Like most nerves, it runs adjacent to an artery. So one of the things you can draw your eye to is the visualization of that suprascapular artery, the pulsation in the suprascapular fossa, or if you do the posterior approach following the suprascapular notch from the spinal glenoid notch. Um, one of the things I think Eric's, Eric is going to get into this is really just getting your hands on the ultrasound, because if you don't have that experience and the first time you do it is with the patient, it's too late. You know, one of the things I did when I was a resident was I grabbed the ultrasound machine and I just scanned myself for hours, uh, just looking for things. And once you started to understand where things were, then things became much easier. So the actual needle, you know, location, everything like that, Tim, is super easy. It's just really understanding the ultrasound anatomy. Yeah, absolutely. The way the way that we can try to promote that is to get the access and get the opportunities. So I I've always encouraged people learning a new technique to try to get as many tips and tricks from experts who've been there before them. Um, and and part of that is again through the opportunities that we're going to be offering. So the first one of those opportunities is scheduled for September 20th, the uh, Advanced Technology and Techniques course uh, that that follows. Uh, for fellows right after the ASPN annual meeting. And then in December at the course, uh, which is focused specifically on emerging technologies, then again, we'll have the, the opportunity for participants to get hands-on. Um, the best way to do some of that is to reach out and, and to, to try things out, but then to read and find video. Um, and some of that is support that is already out there and available. And some of that is, our, is 
uh, content that we're generating through ASPN or that's being generated through some of the device manufacturers as well. And so the, the biggest part that we recommend is knowing where the good quality resources are. And, uh, and uh, you can learn a good habit in much better time than you can learn and have to retrain from a bad habit. That's a great point. Uh, Dalwood? Yeah, thoughts? Ramo, I had a follow-up question on, on your presentation. Uh, now with these, you know, PNS specific platforms that utilize these micro IPGs and an external power source, uh, a therapy disc, can you describe to me what your kind of your, your, your patient workflow is with kind of deciding, you know, what's going to be the compliance with wearing a, a therapy disc and how you kind of go about that? Do you do it prior to the trial? Do you do it prior to the implant? And then in the patients that you have implanted that way, What's been the satisfaction with having an external power source versus kind of what we've typically done the last, you know, 20 years, uh, uh, an internal power source? Yeah, thanks, Dawa. That's a great question. So specific to this platform, you know, besides doing your usual work of the diagnosis and, and understanding that that is the particular nerve and where you're going to attack it, uh, once you've made that decision to use this particular platform and do that implant, uh, the important thing to do because you're going to have that external therapy disc is have them do what's called a wearability study, where they actually wear that external adhesive clip uh, at some part of their body. Number one, it gives the patient an opportunity to see what that adhesive feels like and reaching back there and putting the disc in. Uh, it also gives them the opportunity to see what it's like to take it off with the spray that's provided. It's the same adhesive that's used for a colostomy bag, for those of you familiar with that. Um, and then they get to see how it is to recharge, et cetera. We usually let them do that for about three days so they can see how it is when they're in their car, when they're sleeping, when they're doing all their certain activities or gardening. Um, and then that's when they decide if they want to move forward with it. Now, a majority of patients say, yeah, I can I can live with that. But there are some patients who say this isn't for me. You know, it catches you know, my belt in a certain way. I don't want to wear it. That's great because I'm glad I didn't implant those people and they have something that they don't like. Then after that, it's the trial. And then after that, it's the implant. And the experience that I've had with patients who've gone through the whole process is that they actually find the charging to be no big deal. Uh, they're about, I would say, two to three weeks where they're getting used to everything, getting used to having an external therapy disc, wearing that all the time. Uh, but after about two to three weeks, it basically becomes a part of them, just like you're not really realizing you're wearing pants right now, assuming you're wearing pants right now. Um, and no you comment. just get used to that sensation. <laughs> <laughs> you get used to it and patients seem to be really happy with it. They're provided two therapy discs. So while one is being used, the other one's being charged, you can swap it out and then you have the next one for the next 12 hours. So the patient satisfaction has been very high with it, my experience. So Ramo, you're, you're not allowed to ask about pants on these webinars, you know, it's just uh, oh, people, sorry. that's a secret. Um, so to claim your CME credit, here's a, a reminder. Uh, and again, we'll be having several more CME accredited sessions uh, going forward, uh, www.danamiller.com backslash activity backslash 1917 backslash so certainly claim your your um, your your um, hours for tonight and the last thing i want to leave you with uh first of all i want to thank all of our faculty tonight and and i uh, think uh Dawood for his work and we want to leave you with uh, a couple of other things do you want to talk about the innovations in pain yeah so i think erica did tease this a little bit thank you to her um so you know our annual meeting has now been you know rescheduled it was previously scheduled to be in the summer uh but given you know the pandemic we've uh, decided to move this to the fall so it'll be uh september 17th uh which was our uh the rescheduled date for our think tank which will occur prior to our annual meeting and then we'll have our annual meeting september 18th through the 20th in Lowe's, Miami. Uh, and as Erica mentioned, uh, it really a big initiative we have this year, especially it's dedicated really to this year's fellows who have had a lot of their training cut short is having uh, an advanced graduating fellows workshop where we go through a lot of these advanced techniques and interventions that they really haven't had as much time as they really should. No, that's great, great reminder. And then the last thing I wanna talk about, and this is how we'll leave tonight, um, I've been working with different charities for many years, raising money, and this year we're working to raise money for several things, PPE, for masks, for those who are coming out of COVID, for those who are quarantined who don't have very much money and who need food and shelter. And there's a, a charity called Iron Aid, and Iron Aid is really uh, started from the Ironman Foundation, which I've been involved with for years, but now it actually is for healthcare, to help those who need healthcare needs, including PPE for our 
our fellow physicians and nurses, but also, again, for those who need help in quarantine, for those who need masks once they leave the COVID infection. So we're gonna have this fundraiser at six o'clock Pacific Standard Time, nine o'clock, and we'll have speakers, we'll have people like Paul Lynch, who's now at Bellevue volunteering. He's joined my, my good friend, Nick Brimmer, who joined him uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, we're going to have uh, Sarah Hartman of the Airman Foundation, Karina Krasinsko, who Karina actually was the first person to text me asking about masks. Uh, Sonny uh, Ja, who actually was uh, really uh, shouted out by Gavin Newsom in California. Uh, Priyanka Ghosh, who talks about fellows being pulled out of training, and then some of our colleagues from other societies. So please join us next Monday night and consider a donation to this important charity. With that, Dawood, I'll give you the last word of the night. No, thank you, everybody. Um, really want to uh, thank our sponsors who really did uh, step up to the plate to make this webinar poss possible. Um, so thank you to Mainstay Medical, uh, NALU, and Sprint uh, PNS Systems. So uh, we thank all of you guys. And uh, we look forward to continuing this. Look forward to our next uh, clinically-based uh, webinar coming in about two weeks. Uh, we'll be contacting all of you guys shortly on this. Uh, thank you all for your attention and thank you to the panelists. You guys did a fantastic, wonderful job. Thank you for, uh, you know, using your time in this really trying time to help educate our colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for organizing.